Hi, and thank you for joining our educational webinar with Dr. Leslie Randall, who will discuss how advances in genetics offer women more preventative options and better targeted treatment against ovarian and uterine cancer. My name is Sharni Smith, and I am a member of VCU Health's marketing team. So before we begin the presentation, I'd like to first make note that we'll hold all questions until the very end. So please feel free to drop those questions in the comments area and we'll address them during the Q&A. Dr. Leslie Randall serves as the Director of Gynecologic Oncology at VCU Massey Cancer Center. She's also a member of the Developmental Therapeutics Research Program at Massey and a professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the VCU School of Medicine. Randall earned her medical degree from the University of Louisville and she completed her residency at the University of Louisville School of Medicine and a fellowship at the University of California, Irvine. Thank you, Dr. Randall, for joining us today. So I'll now turn the show over to you. Thanks, Sharnice. Um, thanks so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me to talk about uh, women's cancers. We don't get to talk about this a whole lot. So tonight I'm gonna to talk about our most common cancers, which are ovarian and uterine cancer. We're gonna start with uterine cancer. Um, this is the most common cancer that I treat. And um, some people think that we treat breast cancer because we're like the female cancer doctors, but really we treat what I call the below the belt cancers um, and uterine and ovarian are, are, are uh, part of those. So if you look at these statistics, it's really interesting with uterine cancer because the incidence of uterine cancer is rising very steadily and very significantly. So if you look back at 2008 here, I hope you can see my pointer. Um, 2008 was when I finished my fellowship and we had about 40,000 um, cases of endometrial cancer a year and we were losing about 7,500 women per year. And in the grand scheme of things, this is a, you know, a pretty low number in comparison to the other cancers. But look at how this number has increased. And so we're living in an era where through early detection and prevention, most of our cancers are declining in incidence, um, but uterine cancer is increasing. And here's why, um, as the population ages, um, the median or you know the average age is 60 for uterine cancer and here's the other reason um, obesity and being overweight um, these are the strongest risk factors for uterine cancer and as these increase the incidence increases and so right now this is a public health um, issue uh, for women across the united states other reasons to get uterine cancer that are much less common than the age and the weight uh, reasons are estrogen hormone replacement therapy, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and then about 10% of our cancers are due to hormonal, uh, I'm sorry, for genetic, they're genetic uh, in nature. So this is the anatomy. Uterine cancers typically start in the lining of the uterus and they can spread into this muscle portion. They can spread down into the cervix. They can spread out into um, the tubes and ovaries or the upper uh, vagina, and because they start in the lining, they're typically symptomatic. Most women will have vaginal bleeding. So it starts here, it comes through the cervix, and it comes out um, into the vagina as abnormal bleeding. And because most of these women are older, they have stopped having periods, and this would um, typically present as bleeding after your period stops, which is never, ever, ever normal, um, never normal. Uh, so these are the symptoms and um, irregular bleeding or postmenopausal bleeding by far the most common symptoms of uterine cancer. After that, you can have you know, a growth or a mass in the uterus or the adnexa refers to the tubes and ovaries, or you can have some pelvic discomfort. Um, it's common to have pelvic or abdominal discomfort and most of the time it's not cancer. By far, these are the most common um, symptoms of uterine cancer, this bleeding. And the way we diagnose it is to do a biopsy in the office. So this looks terrible. <laughs> Any procedure looks terrible in pictures, but really this is kind of a minor procedure that we do in the office. We've just put a very small plastic flexible tube into the uh, uterus. It's about the size of a, a soda straw and you can uh, pull back on that and just um, take a small um, suction sample. 
and send that uh, for a look under the microscope. Um, and this is what uterine cancer looks like under the microscope. So this is your science lesson for the evening. Um, the normal lining of the uterus looks like this. There are a few little, these are little glands. And then most of this is what we call a supportive tissue, but uterine cancer happens when these glands that are stimulated by hormones just completely overgrow and take over all of that supportive tissue. So you can see here, these glands have crowded things out. And there are different types of uterine cancer. And this tells us kind of how this tumor behaves. Is this a non-aggressive tumor like this tumor, or is this a very aggressive type of cancer like these? And so that's what you have an oncologist like myself to interpret that kind of data. So what we do for women that have that diagnosis, they need surgery. Uh, we do a hysterectomy. We remove the tubes and ovaries. And sometimes we take pelvic lymph node biopsies. It just depends on um, the type of cancer in the stage. And we decide that as oncologists when we do the surgery. Um, we used to do these surgeries through big incisions, but uh, recently, um, We've adopted what we call minimally invasive surgery approach. Um, we use standard laparoscopy and we're doing about 15% of these surgeries, almost up to 20% with regular laparoscopy, but minimally invasive surgery really took off when we had what's called a robotic surgery. So in the United States, we only have one uh, FDA approved robot. It's called the Da Vinci robotic system. And the da Vinci robotic system really helped us uh, do many more hysterectomies um, with laparoscopy because it just made it um, an easier and safer procedure. So this taps out, this graph taps out at 2012 where we were doing about 35% of our endometrial cancer hysterectomies. Um, if we projected this, that if we looked at this data today, we're probably at about 80% of hysterectomies. The other 20% can't be done through small incisions because the uterus is too large. Um, so some women, a lot of women are cured with this hysterectomy, but some need radiation and some need chemotherapy. Um, chemotherapy is usually a standard type of chemotherapy, the type where you lose um, your hair, but we really um, only need to do that if we have like an advanced stage cancer spread outside of the uterus. Uh, we can do hormonal therapy sometimes as chemotherapy, and we're developing new treatments like immunotherapy uh, for uterine cancer. And so to talk about these treatments in more detail is um, kind of the subject of another, another lecture. Uh, but these, there are lots of options you know, for women with uterine cancer, and luckily most of them are cured with surgery. Um, for women who don't want to have a hysterectomy because they haven't had a baby yet, we actually have options for fertility sparing treatment. Now, interestingly, because uterine cancer, the rate is increasing, it's mostly increasing in the younger age group. And that's because obesity and polycystic ovarian syndrome are increasing in that young population. And so many of these women haven't had children yet. And so what we can do is um, provide them with a hormonal type of treatment that allows them to keep their uterus. Um, first, we have to do a CT scan or an MRI to check to see if the cancer is spread. If the cancer is spread anywhere, then the patient's not eligible for this type of treatment. Um, but if there is no evidence of cancer spread, then we don't do a hysterectomy and we can give them a hormonal treatment. And we can either use hormonal pills or we can use an IUD. And when you say hormonal treatment, you say, but Dr. Randall, you just told me that hormones cause this cancer, so why would I take hormones? It's actually a hormonal treatment that's anti the bad hormones. So it's putting back in a good hormone called progesterone. And um, if we do that treatment, we still have to check to make sure the cancer is not getting worse. And so we do that with that endometrial biopsy procedure that I showed you in the picture um, every three to six months. And that's kind of the hardest part of all of this is having to do those repetitive biopsies. Um, but if the cancer goes away, then we um, will often encourage our patients to um, try to get pregnant and have uh, a baby at that point. Having a baby is not an on-demand kind of a thing. You know, sometimes women need this treatment for a long time because they're not 
in a you know permanent relationship they're not married yet um, also during this time many of these women have cancer because they have extra weight uh, that they carry and so right now during this type of treatment is a really good time um, to stress weight loss and physical activity um, and many of them if they lose weight will not need any more treatment the cancer actually can just go away um, with weight loss uh, weight loss is not a good treatment um, for women who've already had their children. Um, those women need to go ahead and go straight to hysterectomy so that their cancer doesn't get worse. Uh, but for our women who are on hormonal fertility sparing treatment, um, they do have time to you know, look at weight loss um, techniques and to put on some muscle mass. Just putting on some muscle mass will help them kind of um, chew up the, the muscle mass actually kind of burns up those extra hormones that cause the cancer. And so uh, that can be a really effective way to manage this long term. So what do you do to reduce your risk? Maintain an ideal body weight. Um, the birth control pill has been shown to reduce risk. So if that's an option for you, um, that may help. Um, you should avoid estrogen only hormone replacement formulation. So if you're postmenopausal, you're on hormones, um, you can ask your gynecologist, you know, am I increasing my risk of cancer by using um, these hormones or is this a non-cancer causing type of a hormone regimen? Um, genetic counseling is really important if you have a family history of colon, endometrial, ovarian, or urinary tract cancers. We have that specific genetic syndrome occurs uh, in women who have this type, these cancers in their family history. And then if you have abnormal bleeding, definitely don't think it's just a phase or it's just an annoyance, seek evaluation of that. So moving on to ovarian cancer, um, this cancer is not quite as common. You can see here about a third of the incidence of, of uterine cancer. Uh, but the problem with ovarian cancer is that it's our most, it, we call it our most deadly cancer. Um, unfortunately, um, most of the women who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer come in at an advanced stage, and many of these women will pass away from this disease, unfortunately. We've gotten so much better um, recently with new treatments. We're getting better every day, getting new treatments every day. We've had three FDA approved new drugs just this year, um, but this still has a, a fairly poor prognosis. These are the risk factors for ovarian cancer. Um, age, again, family history. Um, if you carry a mutation in the breast cancer gene, BRCA1 or BRCA2, um, that can increase your risk as much as 60 times um, the normal baseline risk for ovarian cancer. There are some other gene mutations that raise that risk. And the Lynch syndrome that's associated with uterine cancer also increased the risk for um, ovarian cancer. And then endometriosis is a slight increased risk for ovarian cancer. If you look at family history, family history doesn't really re increase the risk that much unless you have one of these genetic mutations. So genetic testing is really important here to see, are you on this 60, 30 to 60 times increased risk or are you on three to five times increased risk scale. So the reason why ovarian cancer um, comes in at such an advanced stage is because it spreads so quickly. So here we have this ovarian tumor. Sometimes the tumor starts in the end of the fallopian tube. And what happens is this at these, the abdomen is just open to this, the ovary. And so if you get a tumor on the surface, it will just start to kind of shed off into the abdominal cavity. And then as you, even as you breathe, the, their fluid in the cavity and it will just sort of turn and turn around and it will allow the tumor to spread into the abdomen very quickly. Um, so this is what an ovarian cancerous tumor looks like on ultrasound. Um, this is supposed to be just a little ovary about this big, but unfortunately this ovary is much larger than normal. It has this is fluid. We call this a cystic component. It has solid components to it. There are abnormal blood vessels growing in the solid component. And so this looks very suspicious to us on an ultrasound picture. Um, that quick spread involves 
um, implants in the tumor area, in the abdominal area. So this is an implant. This is an example of an implant. So this is a CT scan where you can see the pelvic bone. You can see all these little white areas and these are intestinal areas and all of this is normal, um, but this tumor implant is not normal and this tumor implant is not normal. And so we know how to look for that on a CT scan. These tumors also make fluid. So this gray, actually this is a liver. If you've never seen this on a CT scan. Um, some of these pictures may look kind of crazy to you. Um, I look at these all day. So I'm gonna just try to talk you through these. Um, but this is fluid. Um, all of this gray area here, this is fluid. None of that's really normal. And so that's suspicious for um, cancer. And so that fluid and those implants cause these symptoms. And so ovarian cancer has actually been called a silent killer because women come in with these advanced symptoms um, and are assumed to never have had symptoms. But really, if we you know, go back and ask women who have ovarian cancer, they look back in hindsight and say, you know, really, I had a bloating and I had this abdominal pain, or I would take three bites of my food and I felt full and I just couldn't eat any more than that. And I love to eat. So that's not normal for me. Um, but you know, sometimes it gets chalked up to indigestion. It gets chalked up to other things. Um, and you look back, these women really did have um, symptoms. So, you know, we don't think it's necessarily a silent killer. It's just maybe one that people are not so aware of. And so awareness is really, really important for ovarian cancer. Now, you're probably sitting there thinking, oh my God, like I had these symptoms just last week. These symptoms are really common and they're um, commonly come with very, you know, not cancerous diagnosis. So most of the women who have these symptoms don't have cancer. So it's a little confusing. Um, but the trick is that if you have these symptoms and they get worse over time, or if they don't go away after two or three weeks, or you know, if you're trying the reg, you know, the common treatments and those treatments aren't working, um, then you need to start to get concerned about these symptoms and bring them up to your doctor. And, you know, we're in, in my world, we're pretty adamant that if your doctor, you know, seems to not be concerned and you're concerned, then, you know, ask another doctor. Um, it's never bad to get a second opinion on these types of symptoms, but awareness here is really, really key. For treatment, again, surgery is the mainstay of treatment uh, for ovarian cancer. We do a hysterectomy, remove the tubes and ovaries, and then we try to take out any of those implants that you saw in the CT scan. Um, sometimes that involves doing intestinal surgery. Sometimes we even take out a spleen. Um, I tell my patients, um, if I see a tumor on something and it's something that you can live without, I'm gonna take it out. The goal is just to get everything out um, the more tumor we remove, the better the long-term prognosis is for our patients. Um, sometimes we do a heated chemotherapy infusion in the belly during surgery. This is called a HIPEC treatment, a hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemo treatment. This is kind of a uh, schematic of the, we um, put chemotherapy in a, a, an infusion pump that heats it, goes into the belly, and then it has an outflow catheter. And so the chemotherapy just circulates into the abdomen for about an hour and a half during the surgery. And we think that reduces the risk of reoccurrence, but we're still doing clinical trials to see if that's really helpful or not for our women. Um, after that, or sometimes even before surgery, we'll do chemotherapy um, to shrink the tumors and then to clean up anything left behind from surgery. And then we do what's called a maintenance treatment where we give um, a treatment that's not quite as um, intense as chemotherapy. Um, sometimes it's a pill. Sometimes we give an, um, a treatment that attacks the blood vessels in the tumor that's called an anti-angiogenesis drug. Um, and again, this is another whole talk in and of itself, uh, but just to give an overview of what the treatment is like uh, for this. Um, because it comes because these treatments are often not curative, early detection would be really important for ovarian cancer um, so that we could find it before it comes in at that advanced stage. But unfortunately, there's really no good test for early detection um, as of yet. 
Um, the uterine cancers are typically detected early because they have bleeding symptoms and then you do a biopsy and you find it early in most cases. Ovarian cancer is not like that because it grows internally. And those symptoms, unless you have those symptoms, you really don't have a, you know, a trigger that we have that we're looking at blood tests and ultrasound to try to do screening for ovarian cancer, but they don't really work all that well. And you'll read about a blood test called CA125 on the internet. And I'm gonna tell you why CA125 is not a very good test because it seems like, well, if you just get a blood test, then you would know um, if you have cancer or not. But here's the problem with the blood test. So most women have a normal level of the blood test and it stays the same over time. This is the yellow line. Um, some women have uh, benign reasons to have this or non-cancerous reasons to have an elevation in their CA125 level. Um, endometriosis is a really good example of something that will raise the CA125 level, but is not associated with cancer. Um, so those women will have abnormal levels, but they will stay stable over time. They won't change. Women who have cancer, their levels will increase over time. Um, but it takes a long time for them to reach this detection threshold. And so all that time that that CA125 is slowly rising, but still in the normal range, that cancer is growing. And so really we just get to women too late and it's not really very effective. So in terms of seeking help, um, if you have those um, symptoms, the diagnosis and treatment of this can be really complex. Um, sometimes it involves multiple doctors um, if you are suspected to have ovarian cancer or your family member or friend is suspected to have this or has any of those findings on the CT scan that I showed you or any of those symptoms, um, it's best that they see a GYN oncologist like myself. Um, we're the doctors that have the most experience in treating this and we can help get to the bottom of the diagnosis, help get patients to the right treatment quickly. Time is of the essence for these women. Um, and it's been shown in multiple research studies that when women have a GYN oncology doctor involved in their care, that they have a better outcome over time. How do you reduce your risk? You can use pills again for birth control. So here we have two cancers that birth control pill can help reduce the risk for. Um, over five years of use reduces the risk by 50%. You can reduce the risk by up to 90% um, with 10 years of use and that protection never goes away. So if you use the pill 20 years ago for birth control, you'll always have that ovarian cancer protection risk. It's a very strong protection. We think tubal ligation may help prevent ovarian cancer. It's not as strong as a protection as the, the birth control pill is, um, but here's where it's really powerful. Genetic counseling. So if you have a family history of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, colon, uterine, or urinary tract cancers, um, it's important to seek genetic counseling. You can access this through a primary care doctor, through an oncologist, um, even maybe even picking up the phone and calling a genetic counselor um, to make an appointment. We have this service available at Massey. And we have tremendous genetic counselors. Um, they're very skilled and very knowledgeable about um, these diseases and they test our patients all the time. There's a surgery that we can do to reduce the risk of ovarian cancer if you're found to have that genetic mutation. Um, we do small incisions and we take out the tubes and ovaries with laparoscopy surgery. Sometimes we do a hysterectomy, sometimes we don't. The decision to do that is complicated and um, it, we do that on an individual patient by patient basis. Um, these are all the studies um, over time that have looked at the risk of ovarian cancer if you don't have surgery versus if you do have surgery. And the biggest study to date, the most recent study shows that the ovarian cancer risk is reduced by at least 85% if you have this procedure. Now, why wouldn't that reduce the ovarian cancer risk by 100%? That doesn't really make sense, does it? Um, part of that has to do with some of the challenges it is to do just research and getting accurate data when we do research. But when women have the tubes and ovaries removed, this whole entire abdominal lining can actually develop into cancer, which sounds crazy. You say, well, what's the point of having my tubes and ovaries out if I still have a high risk of having cancer 
from the lining of the abdomen because we can't really remove the entire lining of the abdomen. And my answer to that is that the, the, the benefit of that far outweighs any residual risk that you might still have of getting cancer in that lining. The, time, the incidence of cancer in the lining that we leave behind is less than 1%. So this is a very effective procedure. And actually, I always tease my patients when we're talking about this procedure is that I'm overtrained to do this surgery because it's such a simple operation, but it's my favorite surgery because it has the best effect on the patients that I take care of. It has the most impact, the most powerful impact on reducing the burden of cancer in our patient population. So I love this surgery and uh, I love it when we find uh, carriers of these mutations because we can really make a strong impact and lower their risk uh, for cancer. Interestingly, in the premenopausal women that are diagnosed with the mutations and that have surgery, um, their risk of breast cancer is reduced by 50%. And we think it has something to do with the hormonal influence that the ovaries have. Um, but that's a really interesting benefit of having the tubes and ovaries removed because it is, um, you know, not all, it's not all roses when we remove the ovaries, especially at a young age. Uh, for the BRCA1 mutation carriers, we recommend 35 to remove the ovaries. Um, for BRCA2, we recommend 40 to 45. Um, any surgery has infection, bleeding, or risk to the intestines or the bladder, but the real issues are the long-term repercussions of taking the ovaries out at 35 or 40 or 45. Um, these women will have infertility. They will no longer be able to have children. Um, they have quality of life issues related to the loss of hormones at such a young age with hot flashes and night sweats. And um, usually you would treat that with hormone therapy, but um, these women often are not considered good candidates for hormone therapy because their breast cancer risk is increased. Um, at Massey, we believe in giving these patients low dose hormones. Um, to help manage their quality of life changes that happen as a result of this surgery. Um, they can also have uh, premature heart disease or osteoporosis as a result of move, removing the ovaries early. Um, so we have to be um, mindful about those risks and discuss those with our patients. Um, so because of these risks, this surgery is really only for high risk genetic carriers. So if you're worried about your uh, risk for ovarian cancer. We don't just go remove ovaries willy-nilly. Um, we really do this only for our highest risk patients because of these risks of the procedure. Interestingly, when we take the tubes and ovaries out, we look in little microscopic sections for tumors um, to make sure that women don't have cancer. About 3% of women will actually have cancer when we do the preventative surgery, uh, cancer that we didn't know was there. Interestingly, what we learned by doing this procedure is that most of those actually happen in the tube. And so we thought tubal cancer was something that never happened when in fact about 50% of ovarian cancers actually did start in the tube. It's just that they were so advanced by the time we diagnosed them that we just assumed they had started in the ovary. Um, so now we're thinking, well, maybe we should just remove the tubes and then we don't have to go through premature menopause uh, with removing the ovaries at a young age. And so we actually have a new clinical trial here at Massey um, that's looking at just that. And so this is a national trial that is run through the National Cancer Institute. We're looking to recruit uh, over 2,000 women across the nation um, for this trial. We're hoping to recruit um, as many as possible at Massey, but at least um, 20 or more patients. Um, so we're looking at women that are under 35 or that are over 35, but that are under 50 and they specifically have this BRCA1 um, mutation. And so those women can choose to have either a, self, a, a tube removal only um, with or without a hysterectomy or they have the tubes and ovaries removed. And sometimes uh, Sometimes these trials are what we call randomized where you don't get to choose which group. Um, but women who enroll on this study do get to choose which group um, they go into. Every year they're offered the standard procedure, which is removal of the ovaries. But this trial is really designed to see if this removing the tubes alone 
is going to be as helpful as removing the tubes and ovaries, but save the women from having to go through such a premature menopause. So if you know anyone, or if you hear of your friends that are diagnosed with this BRCA1 gene, um, we have a clinical trial for women who are candidates for risk reducing surgery. So we went over that. So I'm gonna just um, give you an, a, t a flavor of some of the other clinical trials that we have going on here at Massey. Um, we have trials for ovarian cancer that has come back after the first treatment. So we call this recurrent uh, ovarian cancer. And we break um, ovarian cancer up into two groups, chemo chemotherapy resistant and chemotherapy sensitive. That's something that we can worry about. That's not something we expect our patients to understand what that means, though some of them do. Uh, and we have several different trials available. So we have one trial that's uh, two pills uh, in lieu of chemotherapy. We have an immunotherapy trial. We have another uh, chemotherapy in the um, standard intravenous chemotherapy um, that's available. And then in our platinum sensitive patients, we have an immunotherapy combined with a pill. So really trying to you know, develop new treatments that are more effective, that are easier for patients to take, treatments where your hair doesn't fall out or where you don't feel nauseous, you're throwing up, you're not in bed, you're actually able to function better and to have a better quality of life. Here are endometrial cancer um, clinical trials. Right now we're mostly looking at immunotherapy um, for women who are newly diagnosed who need radiation, for women who need chemotherapy, and so I wouldn't expect anyone in the audience to have any clue what I'm talking about other than to know that we have these trials available. So if you know women that are going through battling these cancers, um, we can see them and we can see if they might fit um, into one of these clinical trials. And then um, we didn't talk about this tonight, but cervical cancer is an important um, cancer that's caused by human papillomavirus. That is a cancer that's common in our um, area here in Virginia. And so we're looking at different types of therapy um, based on what stage uh, the patient is in and diagnosis. Um, and here again, immunotherapy. So immunotherapy is a big theme um, for our cancers with you know, immune treatments really revolutionizing cancer and other types of um, cancers. We're now Find it, you know, trying to study this in our uh, in our women's cancers, and then we have uh, what we call phase one trials. So these are our early. Um, some of these are uh, many of these are not available. These treatments are not available um, on the market. Some of these are the very first in uh, clinical trials looking at these um, drugs. And I left the actual names of the clinical trials here on this slide, whereas I didn't on the other slides, just so you can see that this is kind of a complex, complicated business, um, but that's what we do here at Massey. This is what we love. We're really excited about um, clinical trials, bringing new treatments um, to our patients. So it is Gynecologic Cancer Awareness Month on September. So you guys are ahead of the game now. You can share uh, this information with everyone that you know, with your family, with your friends, and the more word of mouth that gets out there, the more women will know uh, about these cancers. Um, you can get more information on our Massey website, and you can get more information um, at the um, cancer.gov website, and then the Society for Gynecologic Oncology, or the sgo.org has really good information as well. So that is the end of my presentation and um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Randall. So we will now open the floor for questions. So we're first gonna read some questions that were submitted in advance. So the first question is, will I be able to have children after my treatment? And I believe this should be for both cancers. Yeah, so we talked about, this is a great question. Um, most women are really concerned about this. So luckily uterine and ovarian cancer, we said the age is the most common risk factor. Right. So most women who get cancer are older. Um, they pass their childbearing age. And so um, most women don't have to worry about that. 
for the women that do um, the endometrial cancer, we definitely have that fertility sparing option available. For ovarian, it's much harder. Um, ovarian cancer, it's harder to keep fertility, but we do have some options for these women. They just have to be evaluated by a doctor like me. Okay, thank you. And the next question we have is, I've seen a few at-home genetic testing for BRCA gene mutations linked to breast cancer. Would you recommend these? And I think for this question, you mentioned during your presentation that the BRCA gene mutations could be a risk factor for ovarian cancer. So do you think this is a better option for you to know your risk? So I'm biased, but I think the whole world should have cancer genetic testing so that it's such powerful information. Right, um, right now, we're just testing women who are at risk and uh, risk is having a history of these cancers like we talked about in the presentation. The mm -hmm. at-home kits, most of them are good. Um, there's so much more to genetic testing than just the test itself. Right. There's a lot of counseling that goes into it. The test results have to be interpreted by someone who's trained to understand what it means. It's really right. best to have that done with a genetic counselor. And we have those here at Massey. Oh, perfect. Um, and the next question, can you walk through the ways to reduce your risk for ovarian cancer? So is there any way to prevent ovarian cancer? The strongest, most impactful way is to know if you have a mutation, a genetic cancer mutation, and then to have the risk reducing surgery. Um, after that, there's really not, it sounds so fatalistic, but there's not a whole lot um, that you can do the, right. the birth control pill is probably the next most strongest, and we talked about that in the presentation as well. So genetic testing and birth control pill. Okay. Um, and the next question, what are the benefits of a clinical trial versus a standard treatment, and why should I trust being treated with drugs that are not yet on the market? This is my favorite question. <laughs> And I, I love this question because clinical trials, it, I, I hate the word, I hate the phrase, it just sounds scary. The truth of the matter is, is that every time we give a patient a cancer treatment, in mm -hmm. essence, it's somewhat of a clinical trial. Right. That means I'm gonna give you a treatment in the clinic and I'm not sure if it's gonna work or not. For most treatments that I give, I have good data to show me that it's gonna work. Right. The way I got that data is from women who enrolled on clinical trials. So if we didn't have that information, I would have no idea what to do. I would have no idea how to counsel women, what to expect or what their mm -hmm. outcome would be with treatment A versus treatment B. This is how we learn. Um, right. There are so many protections in place to protect women from side effects. We monitor them closely. We make sure that it's done in an ethical way. We have outside people monitoring our clinical trials to make sure that we're conducting them in a safe and ethical way. Um, there's so much oversight. I wish I could just tell the world, but I'm so glad that someone asked that question. Thank you. So yeah, much. it's a good question. Um, the next question is for high grade serious uh, carcinoma, why don't physicians do CT or MRI to detect or the spread after surgery, chemo and radiation? This is a tough question because it's kind of a very specific case. Mm -hmm. um, it really depends on the situation. I would say in most cases um, for this high grade serous, and high grade serous can either be the uterine or the ovarian type of cancer. Um, most of the time we're doing some CT or MRI. Okay. But if, if there's not one done, there's usually a reason for that. Maybe they already know what they need to do without a CT or an MRI. Sometimes right. just based on the surgery, you know what you need to do and you don't need that test. Okay. It's good to know. Uh, the next question we have, should everyone get genetic counseling? Do you recommend certain women getting counseling over others? So there's a list of women who should have genetic counseling and it's very long and we would be here until midnight. Um, <laughs> we went over that in really strong detail. Um, I hit the high points. Um, anyone who has a family history of these cancers that we discussed um, yeah. should talk to their doctor about genetic testing. Um, anyone who is had um, male breast cancer in the family, pancreatic, prostate cancer that's high risk. Um, really any, any strong family history of cancer, talk to your physician about genetic testing. And if you don't like the answer that you get, call Massey, call the genetic counseling. They can give you an opinion of whether you should come in or not. Okay. 
Um, and the next question, what can I do to prevent a recurrence of cancer? Uh, this is always a really good question. Uh, we want to prevent it from ever happening, but when it does happen, we want to um, prevent it from coming back. We call that secondary prevention. Um, it depends on the cancer type. Um, probably the most, the most, uh, the one where the patients can have the most impact is uterine cancer. So even if you've already had uterine cancer, you can prevent its reoccurrence by keeping your weight down, by exercise, weight loss, um, and then. Uh, after that, um, just other, otherwise it depends on the type of cancer that it is. Okay. Um, and then what age is best to get vaccinated for HPV and can you still get cancer after having the vaccine? The, uh, it's best to get vaccinated before you're ever exposed to HPV, which is transmitted sexually. So before you ever have first intercourse. Um, so kids, boys and girls, um, should be vaccinated starting at age 11. Uh, that's in the pediatricians will give those vaccines. The vaccine is um, already, it's approved for women even over the age of 26. I think it's approved for even up to 45 now. Um, even if you've already been exposed to HPV, there are other types. There are multiple types in the vaccine. It can protect you from other types. But if you've been exposed and you're getting the vaccine after the fact, you can still get cancer. And there are some rare tumors that are not related to to HPV that you can get. That vaccine is 100% effective for the cancers that HPV causes. It's probably the most important thing that's happened in my lifetime as a doctor for, wow. for women's cancer. Wow. Well, thank you, Dr. Randall. That's all the questions that we have today. It was such a pleasure having you join us for this educational webinar. I'm glad that we were able to learn more about the research for causes and cures at Massey Cancer Center, which has led to better ways to detect and prevent, especially for women at high risk for developing ovarian and uterine cancer. So to learn more about Dr. Randall and the VCU Massey Cancer Center, please visit vcuhealth.org or follow at VCU Health and at VCU Massey Cancer Center on Facebook. Once again, thank you, Dr. Randall, and to all who joined today, have a great night. Thank you, have a great night.